we started 6,000 years ago and started taking a look. I said then, every one of these slides is a 12 or 13 week semester. And every one is. That still goes for the Dead Sea Scrolls, for the Letters of St. Paul, for any, any slide that we've shown so far, and that includes everything that's coming up now. By full circle, I mean also in this 6,000 years, we started with the with, with these three religions, we call the religions of Abraham, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Each one started, and then at, at some point, each one went into conflict with each other, with themselves and each other. I mean, Mary Dyer, she wasn't killed by a Catholic, she wasn't killed by a Jew, she wasn't killed by a Muslim. Mary Dyer was hanged by her own people, her own religious dissidents in Puritan America, where there was no religious tolerance at all to anybody except the Puritan way. So each of these religions has had trouble. Then we went off and followed the Jews for a longer period of time, looked at their literature, and now we're coming back to the 20th century. We did American immigration. We do all these historical things that I want you to know something about. And now uh, we come back. I give you no answers. All I give you for the next 100 years of, you, of your lives and the lives of your children are problems. So you're going to have to figure out they're going to have to figure out uh, what this full circle uh, uh, really represents. Uh, uh, a conflict of faith, human nature, what, what's it going to be all about? We know one thing, that the God of these three religions created humanity and then did what? He got sick and tired of them, and what did he do? He destroyed them all. All three religions believe that the flood, he eliminated humanity. Then he brought them back together. He saved Noah and his family, then said, I got to remind myself not to do this again. And what was his reminder? What was the knot in his handkerchief, in God's handkerchief? What did he put in the heaven to remind him not to kill everybody again? A rainbow. That's how we get the rainbow, right? He did a rainbow. But then God got impatient. And somewhere in all the three writings, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we find the thought, the statement, God destroyed the world once by flood, and he will destroy the world again by fire. So that's laying out there. Will he or won't he? And as we enter the 20th century, things are getting a little bit hairy. And we want to take a look at that hairiness before we go back to our literature and see exactly what's going on. You know, we got the 20th century, uh, uh, the histor uh, a history lesson for the millennium and the apocalypse. The millennium is that thing that says, uh, uh, when a thousand years is over, the world is going to shake on its foundations. Uh, for those people of faith, a Messiah, the Messiah, one of the three, the hidden the Amman, the Jewish Messiah finally, the Christian Messiah again will return. But they're all waiting in this millennial moment for something to happen. They all agree it's going to happen with violence. I mean, what, is the, what does the word apocalypse mean? It means an apocalypse. You look at the paintings of Hieronymus Bush, and you see apocalypse. You see the world blowing up, the earth opening up, the heavens and everything. It's, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing, the apocalypse. And we're coming into one of those periods now when people believe it. Um, what's not happening here? Come on. I got it on? Oh, I got it off. Excuse me. Technology. Uh, OK. In the 20th century, we have had two mass wars of mass destruction. Both of them could only have happened with the addition of thing, one aspect that didn't exist 6,000 years ago. What's the connection, engineers? Well, the machine gun is an ass example of it, but what is it? What is it that you people do? Engineers, you create what? Your technology. You are the people who make these things happen. Not just electric toothbrushes, but the 30 caliber water-cooled machine gun. So that's the capacity to do this is 20. It's technology and mass death. You can't have mass death if you're throwing frozen turds at your enemy. That's not mass death or a spear or whatever it is that you want to do to kill the guy opposite you, or they, that doesn't do it. You need to have the technology that's going to create mass death. Even the 30 years war didn't do it. 
The Thirty Years' War was the first one where they had a gun, and you had to put the gun on a stand. You see, did you ever see them do that? You put the gun on a stand, you load it up, you aim it at somebody, you shoot it. To reload the gun, it takes about 15 minutes to reload the single blunderbuss or the gun. So they were really getting it all figured. They had Greek fire, they threw hot, all sorts of things to kill, but it was not effective, but it was the beginning. Then weaponry began coming in, but by World War I, technology, the only thing that didn't work in World War I was the, the technology of arm, how, how armed conflict, the, the art of war hadn't changed. The art of war, what do I mean by the art of war? Say it again, Tarion? The theory behind war and the, 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 the actual practice, the practice of war, which was basic. I mean, what are some of the things about the practice of war? Custer learned you do not walk onto the little bighorn and get surprised by the entire Sioux Nation. That is what Custer learned at the little bighorn. Uh, and yet, when World War I began, I think I mentioned this to you once before, the last written order given to the British Army, to the officers, was to sharpen your saber. Make sure your saber is sharp. What kind of war was that going to be? Oh, uh, well, it, it could be gentlemen had an aspect of it. There was a certain uh, romance of war, and yet, you know, when you stuck a, a, a saber into somebody's guts, whether it was an Agincourt or whether it was uh, wherever it happened to be before, it's not, that's not exactly romantic, or stomp somebody to death with your horse. Uh, but what, what kind of, what, what did you do when you drew a saber? Charged. You charged! You yelled, charge! And that was it. Well, in that war, in World War I, the average length of time that the British officer uh, lived when he got to the front was 30 minutes. They were dead after they got there within 30 minutes. Because where did they go? They were in the front. They pulled out the sword. They yelled charge just like it was Henry V. Or what? They were in the front of the battle. And the front of the battle was the place where they were greeted by 30 caliber water-cooled machine guns from the arms of German family who manufactured arms for everybody in Europe, the great arms manufacturers. Any of you read uh, George Bernard Shaw's play Major Barbara? the man who makes arms for everybody. That was a phenomenon of the 20th century, phenomenon of World War I. Uh, that was the arms of, what's the German family? They're still there. I think they finally got rid of them, but they're still millionaires in Germany. K-R-U-P-P, -P, the arms of Krupp, the Krupp arms manufacturers, yeah. Uh, so I want you to know something about World War I. We'll get into this mass death. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles, everything that we're living through now Every event of your lifetimes now that you read about in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, international news, everything international is a result of the Treaty of Versailles in the modern Middle East. You also know something about Woodrow Wilson and Lloyd George, people of deep faith. People of deep faith can have a, a very, very serious impact on it. Both Lloyd George and Woodrow Wilson were born-again evangelical uh, Presbyterian uh, 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 sons of Presbyterian ministers. Both of them prayed on their knees twice a day. Both of them were men of deep, deep, deep faith who were, arrived, who were dealing in decision making at critical moments. Uh, then also, we're, after 2,000 years, is there going to be a Jewish homeland? Islam had its he heyday when? I put one of those slides up. When was the heyday of Islam? The first caliphate? Eight? But before that. 8th century, 9th century, Cordoba and Baghdad and everything in between was Islam. And they were educating the world. They were the ones who were, in, tech, every, in every respect, they were ahead of everybody. Since then, Christianity got out in front, got aggressive, spread all over the world. The age of exploration, Christianity got out there first and got going. The Jews, they're staying under the radar as much as they possibly can. Their numbers are not going anywhere. But here we come into the 20th century and things are going to change. We also have the rise of totalitarian fascism and socialism coming. Totalitarian fascism and socialism. Where are those two totalitarian regimes in the 20th century? So we, we got it happens in, once in Germany and once in Russia. That goes from czars to 
from Russia to USSR, and in Germany, the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler. Both of them totalitarian, fascism and socialism. Allegedly, fascism and socialism are at two ends of the political theoretical spectrum. What happened? They came together, ultimately, in the Second World War. And then, so who is the godless antichrist? And people start looking for this as the 20th century emerges. I didn't want to go back all the way to the 19th century, but that's when the new evangelical movement really began. What, the, what it was called in England, muscular Christianity. Christianity became muscular. It got on the move. Uh, uh, we're going to go into uh, China. We're going to go into Africa. The missionaries really got going. Christianity was preparing itself for the millennium, for the 21st century. Then World War II, 50 million dead. Is this Armageddon? So the search for the Antichrist, the signs of Armageddon. People are looking for signs. People are always looking for signs, and they're looking for dates. When will it happen? How do we find the magic number when this is all going to happen? So these are things that are right. So is there, is there a Christian and Jewish messianic hope that the Messiah is going to come? The Jews return to Israel. Whether the, what, what's happening with the religions of Abraham? What's going on? So those are the topics I want to be, I want you in the back of your mind. Now we'll go through them a little bit and get it all. History lesson. Everything starts in the Balkans. You got to understand the Balkans to understand the 20th century and where the rest of the world is going. Now the Balkans was the last place where the Ottoman Empire was still entrenched. They didn't get pushed out of Europe until after World War I. So Islam is still in Europe, but these three states that primarily make up the Balkans uh, are also, they talk about the narcissism of minor differences, they all spoke Serbo-Croatian, but they were all really figuring out a way they could hate each other. So you got Croatia, which is Roman Catholic. Come on, where's my little thing? Croatia is Catholic. Serbia is Serbian Orthodox, the Orthodox Church. The, and Bosnia is the last vestige of significant Muslim population, all European, but they were Europeans who were converted to Islam. And they're all in each other's face. They're all going to figure out a way to hate each other, and they do. So there's chaos in the Balkans in the last decade of the 19th century, first decade of the 20th century, Balkan wars all over the place. And then on June 28, 1914. But before that happens, everybody's got an alliance. They're locked up in each other's arms. I mean, what are our alliances today? What are the American alliances? We got NATO. What are the, what, what are the alliances are there? We got, say it again? We got that, we got NAFTA, we got uh, uh, that, we got uh, NATO. Uh, what's, what's going on in Ukraine? NATO reached eastward when the Soviet Union fell apart, and what did NATO do? Had a chance, they went and they grabbed, who joined? Poland joined, the former Soviet states joined NATO, the Russians who were born paranoid get more paranoid, whatever happens, it's still alliances. And in Europe, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, were, real, were not alliances. One woman tied it all together. She was related to every royal house in Europe. She was the grandmother of Tsars and Kaisers, great, great grandmother, uh, grandmother of Tsars and Kaisers. Who was she? Who is the woman that, if you really want to understand what's going on with all these alliances, you really have to go to? She was the Queen of England from 1837 to 1901. Add that up. 1837 to 1901. She's got an age named after her. The Victorian age. It's Victoria. All her children, grandchildren, nephews, aunts, all they do is intermarry. And so you've got alliances, all sorts of things. Most of these people, so you've got the two big ones, the Russians, the French, and the Brits, and the dates are up here. They form one alliance, the Triple Alliance. Italy, Austro-Hungary, Germany, and then finally at the end, the Ottoman Empire, they form, this forms another, uh, empire, another alliance. Then the Balkans, we've got Bulgaria and Serbia, they're another one. It's aid, treaty, alliance, who's dealing with whom, who's breaking that, you know, the, the great game, who's going to conquer they're all also fighting over a country so far away that nobody knows where the heck it is, but everybody goes to war in Afghanistan. 
Everybody in the 19th century wanted to go to war in Afghanistan. It was on the southern border of Russia. They thought, who controls Afghanistan will be able to get into the soft underbelly of Russia and also control all the opium and all the dope that's swinging around. So everybody, where the hell was that? Nobody. And who won any of those wars in the 19th century? Nobody. We lost every one. But people haven't learned the lessons of history, so they just passed that one. So this is what we were producing. Then on June 28, 1914, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, who was the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. That was June 28th. What does Europe do in July? Europeans go do what in July? What do Europeans do in July? They're never around. You can't find a European at home. You go to Paris. Paris is deserted. You go to Berlin. It's empty. You go to London. It's empty. Where do they go? They go on vacation. Europe went on vacation in July, except every general staff. And what did the general staffs do? The Serbian insulted, because he was a, uh, a Serbian, insulted the Austro-Hungarians whose ruler was killed, and they said, if you don't apologize big enough, we're going to come in there and kick your butt, Serbia. The Serbians go to their Slavic friends, their Slavic elder brother. Who's that? Russia. Don't let him do this. Don't worry. We'll take care of you. The Germans go to the Austrians and say, we're with you 100%. And so it starts. And every general staff says what? Mobilize. Mobilize. So while Europe is on vacation, the European armies begin to mobilize. They hadn't had a war for 40 years. It looked like Europe would never go to war again. It was everything seemed hunky-dory in Europe. They would never go to war again. And before, when, when August 1st came, the Germans crossed the border, invaded neutral Belgium, went into France, and World War I began by accident. It was a war that nobody anticipated. Very few people did. The guns went off in August. Everybody said it was August. They looked at their calendar and said, oh, well, we know one thing. It'll be fast, it'll be quick, and we'll be home by Christmas. Everybody believed it. The Germans believed it. The British believed it. The French believed it. Everybody believed we will be home by Christmas. They all uh, declared war on each other quickly. Boom, 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 boom. They said that everybody thought it will be a quick slap in the face. Uh, somebody will, retail, will, uh, will blink and will send this thing, will get this thing all straightened out. It didn't happen. And everything that's happening in your lives now and that will happen with the lives of your children, probably your grandchildren, is a result of the mistakes and errors of World War I and total miscalculations of World War I. Trench warfare, from the English Channel to the Swiss border, if you go get your map of Europe out, the Europeans tried to outflank each other, dug holes, and all the soldiers got entrenched in trenches. They lived underground like animals. The trench, this was a simple, this was the very beginning. By the end of the war, the trenches were elaborate, were monstrous, reinforced. There are still vestiges. You can go walk the battlefields of World War I and still walk through trenches that are there. In huge, elaborate dugouts that were there to protect yourself from the enormous guns that were churning up the ground. They also found four-foot rat skeletons. I mean, the, the, there were bodies everywhere. There were eight, eight or nine million dead soldiers. Nobody was digging them up. You could still go and walk the battlefield at Verdun and find femurs. You can find bones out there. People still go out and look for bones out on the battlefields. Not World War II, World War I, where they find them. So. Trench warfare, uh, military technology, they didn't know what to do. The beginning, the real technology, World War I, the beginning of technology, the beginning of air, air warfare. Now, it was still, somebody mentioned the fact that these were gentlemen. They were knights, knights of the air. So somebody said, well, we've invented a parachute. Most of the pilots wouldn't use them. Why? Not gentlemanly. Not a gentlemanly way to die. When you die, your plane gets shot down, what do you do? You salute the enemy and go down in flames. That's the gentleman's way to die. So this is what it was. Uh, the, the parachute finally came in. And then when they finally developed the means to shoot through the propeller, and you, you were able to use the machine gun in front, that made it a much more bloody war. 
Places were bombed, they had bigger planes. But look at this, compared to what we've got now. It's ironic, where are we back? What's now the newest technology? What have we done away with? In your lifetime, there probably will be no more pilots. In the lifetime of your children, it's all gonna be drones. It'll all be drones, so we'll see where that goes. You know, I don't, they're already they're worried about what, what's gonna happen with pilots. The tank, now it's the Abrams tank, but this was the primitive tank that the British invented in World War I. Terrifying thing, it moved about five miles an hour, but it still was enough to protect soldiers, get behind it, and uh, the worst thing that happened in World War I was the invention of poison gas. And that was uh, this painting by Otto Dix, terrifying painting. Everybody had gas masks. The most terrifying scene was a horse with a gigantic gas mask because they, they needed horses. It was not yet a mechanized army. So this was scary, the horrors of World War I. Blinding, gas, blinding, and Nobel Prizes. In 1918, Fritz Haber, German, won the Nobel Prize for his invention, uh, use of chlorine and uh, phosgene in the manufacture. It, that mean, one of the most obvious byproducts was the gas, but he won the Nobel Prize for it anyway. Uh, uh, the Germans were winning all the Nobel Prizes. American higher education was way behind. The Germans, uh, they were the, the great academic nation of the world at the time. They gas blinded, Nobel guts, lungs being coughed out. We were not in the war. There's a new book out by Eric Larson now on the Lusitania. If you get a chance to read it, it's a very good book. Larson wrote The, uh, the White Devil in Chicago, and he writes good, good nonfiction stuff. And the study of the Lusitania, the sinking of it in 1915, uh, um, uh, Wilson was determined to keep America out of the war. He got reelected in 1916, said we'll stay out of the war. We didn't. They, we turned very violently anti-German, and the United States declares war on Germany. Up until then, it was a stalemate. When we got in, we turned the tide of the war. Uh, well, we brought huge arms, not many soldiers, but huge arms manufacturing, so that when the war ended, finally, November 11th, 1918, what do we call it? You guys call it what? Veterans Day. For anybody over the age of 50 or 60, it's called Armistice Day. It was the day of the armistice, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Very symbolic, very symbolic. Armistice signed, end of the war, Berlin seized by revolutionists, new chancellor begs for order, ousted Kaiser, flees to London. Your four empires are gone. The German Empire, the Hohenzollerns, the Russian Empire, the Romanovs, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburgs, and the Ottoman Empire, gone. So what do you got? What do you got? An enormous vacuum and all sorts of wild political ideas fill it. As far as Wilson was concerned and his idealism, this was going to be the war to end all wars. We're going to have an organization of countries that will guarantee that. that and that was not the United Nations, but the League of Nations. Well, here you are. You can make your own judgments about how that all succeeded. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was a guy who was very interesting. We considered the, the beginning of liberalism, beginning of all that stuff. The thing that's very significant about Wilson is how deeply his faith went. He, he prayed every day, as I said, twice a week. Just one of the letters he wrote to one lady in 1915. I, well, I don't read much with you, but this is one you can read. That's good. My, li my life would not be worth living if it were not for the driving power of religion, for faith, pure and simple. I have seen all my life the arguments against it without ever having been moved by them. So he's not an atheist, he's not a Darwinist, he doesn't believe in that either. Okay, President of Princeton though. Never for a moment have I one doubt about my religious beliefs. There are people who believe only so far as they understand. Understand means what? Reason. They seem to, that seems to me presumptuous and sets their understanding as the standard of the universe. I am sorry for such people. He was a man of such, he and so Lloyd George also, they both shared this tremendous feeling that Christ was imminent, around to come. Presbyterian evangelicals, we go back to the 17th century when Princeton was founded. The Presbyterians have been evangelical. They're sitting, waiting for Christ, just waiting for Jesus to return. Now, at Versailles, this is Six Months That Changed the World, really. That's the name of a book by Margaret McMillan. It's called Paris 1919. You could spend a lifetime studying Versailles. Just the treaty, treaties, because there were more than one around Versailles. You know, uh, they, they didn't invite the losers to Versailles. Who are all these people? The British, the French, 
the Americans, the Italians, the Japanese, they were on the winning side also. Only the winners came. The losers came out of it with only whatever was stuck in front of your desk to sign, you had to sign. In World War II, we called that unconditional surrender. This was an unconditional surrender of sorts, but the Germans thought they were going to be invited. The French thought it was always treaties that ended wars. Well, this was going to be one of the unique treaties of all time. The winners at Versailles got were the winners. The losers got... The, now, what was the technological thing that was also driving this? What, what great technology had exploded, it's, it's still in your face right now, with the, with the navies of the country that used to be run on coal. Coal was the big thing. We have to have coal. Now it was, since 1900, they discovered that ships ran better with, infinitely better with oil. The age of oil had begun. Now, Europe after Versailles, these new countries were coming in. So you got, look at the new countries, uh, Europe after Versailles. Finland was created, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Poland came back off the, no, of the map of no man's land. Poland finally was reestablished again, carved out of Russia. Uh, the Czechoslovakia was carved out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yugoslavia was created as the nation of South Slavs to make the Serbians, Bosnians, and Croatians get along with one another, uh, whether you know, to what extent it worked or didn't work. But these were all new nations that were carved out of the Treaty of Versailles and created uh, new nations in Europe. Uh, they simply made them up as they went along. The Arabs at Versailles. Here, they fought against Muslims. The Arabs were a bunch of Bedouins out there in the Arabian desert all over the place. And they, who got to them? It's a great movie, one of the true great movies. Peter O'Toole plays Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence from Arabia, whatever T.E. Lawrence was, he was a British Don, a smart guy, went to college, learned Arabic, was fluent, he was a scholar, became a lieutenant on the staff of the British uh, general staff in Cairo. It's a good movie to see, 1962, Lawrence of Arabia, if you'll get a chance. And he was an, Ar he was a, an, a, a, an Arab file. He just loved everything about the hot desert, and he couldn't wait to get back there and get something. He was sent on a missionary to the, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, leader of the Arab uh, tribes, uh, King Faisal, and they said to him, get Faisal to revolt against the Turks. He said, it's a tough job because they're all Muslim. Lawrence went, did it. Uh, Faisal and the, Tur and the Arab armies fought against the Turks on the side of Christians and expected independence. Instead, they got Zippo. And you get the feeling at this picture, what is it? it looks like Faisal has just found out what's going to happen. That's King Faisal. Who's this? That's Lawrence. T.E. Lawrence with his little shmata on his head. And here's Faisal. They're all trying to make believe like they're Arabs. Uh, but this guy genuinely knows I got diddled at Versailles. They expected independence, and they didn't get it. What they got was oil in the Garden of Eden. Now, we're in this spot, in this geographic spot, don't forget, where three religions believe that all the action is going to take place. And now it's turned out to be political. The French mandatory area the, out of Versailles, the French get what amounts to Syria, and they create all these nations. The British mandate, what we call Transjordan, uh, Iraq is in there somewhere, and the British and the French divide it all up. The French and the Great divide the spoils. This is the Sykes-Picot Treaty. That was the secret treaty designed by the French and the British to, design, to, do, to do really find out how long they could control the oil of the Middle East. Uh, the, Daniel Gergen's book called The Prize is really very good. There are lots of good books that you can read that are detached, the, the zones. If you look at the cities, the towns that are in there, it's all the towns and cities that we know. Here's Aleppo, here's Mosul, now under the control of ISIS. Here is Basra, uh, the British Red Zone. Not Arabia, there was not part of this, but the British, the British zone of influence, Amman, Jerusalem over here, uh, Damascus over here, and they were, is Beirut over here, the blue zone, the A zone, the B zone, and the red zone. The British and the French divided it up. What about Woodrow Wilson? What did he want? Self-determination, let them all alone. But Wilson came back and found out what? 
He couldn't sell any of this. The United, what's the big result of the Treaty of Versailles? The United States never adopted it, and Wilson had a stroke trying to sell it. He failed. The last years of his presidency were a disaster, and America said, we don't want anything to do with any of this stuff. And the Brits and the French started licking their chops. It's all ours. We've got it. And that's the way it happened in the 1920s. Just to remind you, Abraham's 4,000 years earlier, so we were in the same place. Right, his Ur of the Chaldees, his modern Baghdad, his Haran, where uh, in the book of Genesis, Abraham is told, uh, go and travel, his Damascus, his, Shek his Hebron. So this is, this is it. And so people of faith are seeing this and saying, it's got to happen soon because all of this turmoil is happening here. In the middle of it comes the British decision to acknowledge the possible creation of a Jewish state in the middle of the Middle East. The Balfour Declaration is one page long, but it's a, an enormously important page. The date, November 2nd, 1917. Can I read it without my glasses? Uh, no, I need my glasses. Dear Lord Rothschild, signed by Lord Balfour, uh, the British uh, Foreign Minister, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations which have been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. And here's the, here is the whole thing. This is it, from here to here. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people uh, and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. Here comes a clause. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, that's the indigenous, or this puns the, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in other countries. Why that last line is important. Or the rights and privileges, the political status enjoyed by Jews in other countries. So that the Jews who are in England, in America, in any other country who were not Zionists knew they didn't have to go. Many of them didn't want to go. Zionism was for the Zionists. And uh, as like her, Martin Buber, who was a great Jewish academic intellectual uh, rabbi, said, when I talk about Zionism, I smell pine trees, not palm trees. What did he mean by that? Buber was a German. He said, when I talk about Zionism, I smell pine trees. That means Buber had no intention of going anywhere. He was, from the tips of his toes to the tops of his hair, a German. Well, Hitler changed all of that. But this is the Balfour Declaration. I shall be grateful if you will bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. Herzl died in 1904. Again, he, ought, he would have settled for South Jersey, Arizona, Uganda, uh, wherever he could get a place for the Jews. He was not territorially interested. He wasn't interested in the Bible. He wasn't interested in the homeland in the Middle East. He would have settled for anything. He would have taken Israel if he, or that area if he could have gotten it, but he was looking for Argentina, if he could have gotten that, the Pampas, part of Patagonia. So here we go. Now, for the faithful, for people of faith from the 19th and the 20th century, when will the final struggle begin? Because worldwide, you've got hundreds of millions. Don't forget, how many Christians are there? There are already over 2 billion, and they're growing. And maybe 5, 6, 7, 800 million of them are evangelical. They're waiting for Christ to return. So for the faithful, when will the final struggle begin? Was World War I the awaited apocalypse? It certainly looked horrible enough. Will there be more violence and mass death? Uh, where, when will we find the signs? What are the signs? People are constantly looking for signs. Searching, and, and we know what's going to happen because who's going to show up in this final cataclysmic struggle? The Antichrist. The Antichrist will be there. So who's the Antichrist? You go online now and you Google Antichrist, you're going to find three million hits. Who are the most popular Antichrists today? It could be Ayatollah Khomeini, if you go online, or Ayatollah, whatever his name is, one of the Ayatollahs. It could be 
Barack Obama, who's on the big, big list of, of uh, antichrists. It could be a pope if you're really anti-Catholic. It could be any number of people. I think I saw Brad Pitt on the Antichrist lid also. I mean, you got them all out there because you got all sorts of people who pick out who they consider for the Antichrist. But in the 20th century, you know, then there was Christian Zionism, which really exploded after the Balfour Declaration and the idea that there might be a Jew. What did they see this as? What did Christian Zionists see the Balfour Declaration as? The Jews have to be back in the Holy Land to witness the coming of Christ. So it's all, it's all coming together. People are looking at the Bible. The, but, uh, evangel you know, what, they didn't have television yet. You can go online now on Sunday morning, see a lot of televangelists with the Bible in front of them laying it out to you. And the godless antichrist appears. Who are they? The 20th century had a good number of them. And they're godless. They're godless. They don't believe in God. I mean, uh, although he made his concordat, Mussolini, with the Vatican Church, with the Catholic Church, and they made peace in 1922, Italy was no longer a formal Catholic church country. Mussolini said, no, I'm going to keep them at a distance, and they kept it at a distance. The Vatican lost all its power in 1870. They had no more armies, no more territory, except a tiny little place called... The Vatican State, that's all they got. Whatever a few kilometers it still is today, it's a country. It's got diplomatic relations, it's got everything else, but that's it. What used to be the Papal States? What was the Papal States in the 15th and 16th century when Pius XII conquered? The whole damn peninsula was the Papal States. I mean, the Papal States were powerful, mighty. The Holy Roman Empire, enormous. Here comes Mussolini in 1922, and Italian fascism was born. Now, what is fascism? I mean, political science majors should have these definitions at your fingertips. From the Latin word foscus, a bundle tied together by a, a, a rope, a bundle of rods tied together. It means, with an axe handle coming out of the top, it means we are one people led by one man. So it's, the, it's complete totalitarianism. We are totally together. We don't need elections. Why? We agree automatically. There is no D-I-S-S-E-N-T. There is no dissent. We all believe. And so democracy in Italy went out the window. Uh, and Malduce comes along, everybody loved him. About 15, 20% of the Jews voted for him. He had popular, he was a leftist, he was a rightist. Nobody could tell exactly where Il Duce was coming from. But everybody loved him, everybody voted for him. Uh, and anybody disagreed, the lone individual wound up in big time trouble. But he was not initially just a murderer. Uh, Basolini was just a thug. He was not a murderer uh, without, with a credo. He had no idea uh, other than taking power. This guy, meant it all. Now, Adolf Hitler is not a course of National Socialism, the coming of Hitler, the coming of Nazism, but it's something that should be on your plate for as long as you live, to understand how it happened. Adolf Hitler, German National Socialism, interesting, he called it, na the movement was called National Socialism, Nationalsozialismus. It really confused a lot of Germans. A lot of Germans who were leftists voted for him because they thought he was a leftist. Notice his uniform, uh, that's not a, it's a brown tie. He used to wear a red tie and a brown uniform. So the red tie was because he wanted them to convince them that he was really a man of the left. But he was, he had his own idea of what, uh, of what a government should look like. Nazism, it, the name Nazi comes from National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. Arbeiter, worker, is in the title of the National Socialist Party. So he could, the Germans couldn't figure out what he was. All these people, all they had was emperors and kings. They didn't know what popular democracy was all about. And, but Hitler had it all. And he had laid it all out. By 1925, you knew who were the enemy. By 1925, when he writes this book called My Struggle, Mein Kampf, it's the, the Jews, the Slavs, and the Gypsies. I forgot to write one more word down. The Slavs and the Gypsies, the Slavs were a problem because they occupied territory that the Germans needed, Lebensraum, the space, and that meant which two countries had to get it. And he laid it out in 25. At some point, we need he was going eastward. 
He knew he didn't have anyone. He's going to take France. We need Poland and Russia. I need the land. I need the food. I need it all. And that's what he was going. Jews and gypsies, he, he learned that from, the, from American eugenicists. They were already deep into racial thinking at this time. Remember, America closed the doors in 1920 because of the testimony in front of Congress of academics from Johns Hopkins, Harvard, Georgetown, uh, all over the United States who's saying the, the, head, the shape of the immigrant coming off the boat in Naples does not have enough room to have any brains. Phrenology, bumps, IQ tests had already come in, uh, 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 Binet, all these people were saying, we can judge who's intelligent and who's not intelligent, and the vast majority of the people from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe are ignorant and stupid, and new words come into the American vocabulary. Words like imbecile, moron. These were clinical terms, not insults, clinical terms. This person is clinically an imbecile. This person is clinically a moron. Hitler took from those ideas and said, here we have an entire race of criminal types, imbeciles, morons, people who must be purged. Hitler, when he came to power, the first 200,000 people he killed were Germans who were in insane asylums. And overwhelming agreement on doing this, except for the relatives of the people who got killed, you, 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 you went in uh, because you, you were schizophrenic, uh, you were uh, consummately neurotic, or you were epileptic, and the next thing you know, you got a little urn filled with the ashes of your family. And you went and tried to find out what happened, and well, they were eliminated with injections of oxygen. We have to purify what? The race. Purify, purification of the race came in in the 19th century, ironically, in the wake of Darwin, when people went off the roll in terms of what this meant, what Darwinism really meant. What, what terms did they use? The social scientist Darwinism. Survival of the fittest. Well, how do you determine fit? We got to test their brains. And out of this emerges the whole history of testing of IQ testing, of, of all the testing that emerged from the 19th into the 20th century, hey, we're still doing it. We haven't gotten away from it. The other great one, the Soviet dicta, dictate, dictator, godless communism, and the, the, he came to power in 1922, 20, 24, actually after Lenin died, there was a battle for power in the Soviet Union, another 13 week semester, and Joseph Stalin becomes the dictator of, uh, of the Soviet Union, of USSR, uh, uh, we look at communism as a godless fate. We don't want anything to do with it. It's interesting, the Vatican excommunicated all of the communists, but they excommunicated, excommunicated none of the Nazi Catholics. They, were stayed, they still were able to get uh, marriage and can do any of the, uh, uh, any of the uh, sacraments. It all, September 1, 1939, the apocalypse is starting. World War II, Warsaw was bombed, and this is it. I mean, all of a sudden, it's not little airplanes. It's massive numbers of Luftwaffe planes coming over and destroying. It looks like Sodom and Gomorrah getting destroyed. This is the fate of Polish intellectuals. This picture had to get saved. This is uh, a, a, a Germans executing the faculty at the University of Krakow. Bullet in the back of the head. All these guys show up here. There goes this department, that department. The idea was to eliminate all the Polish intellectuals. And they just shot them one after the other, threw them in a mass pit, and buried them. So if this didn't look like, uh, if this didn't look like the apocalypse, nobody, they were all, this has got to be it. So they were all, the, Pius XII, who was the pope during this time, became pope in 1939, 1958. He stayed, is still a controversy. He's also on the list of the antichrists. He was a biggie on the antichrist list because he was a Germanophile. He loved the Germans. He was German papal nuncio, uh, ambassador to Germany from 33. He was, the Vatican was the first state to recognize Nazi Germany. They were the first one to have, what's it called? A treaty between two countries, of one of which is the Vatican, is called what? A con, concordat. The concordat exists between the Vatican and any other country. They have diplomatic nuncios, ambassadors, like every other country. He was the papal nuncio to Berlin. He urged his, his pope, who was Pius XI, to recognize the German government, and they did. They recognized the German government first and foremost. The, the, why is this an issue today? 
Catholics, why is this an issue today? We have a, you gotta have a Catholic in this class who knows something about this, about pious. What's he up for? He's up for sainthood. He's up for sainthood, and there is a big, yeah. Well, you know, well, you know, because it, 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 it's a, there's a fight within the church itself. Did he, did he let Jews die? Did he do anything to stop the Holocaust? Did he do anything to stop the killing of, you know, forget that he held, didn't help European Jews. Did he do enough to help European Catholics? That was the other issue. And so this is not, normally, normally, when the church is, you got somebody up for beatification and sainthood, there is an automatic procedure called the advocatus diaboli. Is there a Latin student in the class? Anybody know a little Latin? Advocatus diaboli. What does that mean? What is advocatus advocate? Diaboli? The devil's advocate. What's the devil's advocate? You appoint somebody. You, who, we had one in Buncha the Silent. We had a devil's advocate in Buncha the Silent. Do you remember? The, guy, the, judge, the, the, the prosecuting attorney was a devil's advocate. And what did he say? You know, this is a loser. He was silent. I'll be silent. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Let him get the last laugh. But he was the advocatus diaboli. And you're supposed to have one for every time you're up for beatification and then sainthood. Well, the Catholic Church decided to waive it in the case of Pius XII. They didn't want to have, but they can't get away from it. So this thing will be interesting. It'll happen in your lifetime. Either yes or no. They don't want to get a no. So whether they bring it forward or not, we're not sure. Thousands of Catholic priests died in the, in the, in the Holocaust. Thousands of Catholic priests. This guy was the first, and he was sainted. From my Father Max Kolber, the first priest to die at Auschwitz. Where was the church? That's something that you can investigate on your own. That's your business. But they, 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 the, the Catholic priests were invested. This guy, Kolba, you know, what he did, he shows up at Auschwitz, knocks on the commander's door, and says, I would like to take the place of some Jew. You release the Jew, you can have me. And whatever it was, they finally found a kind of a whimsical commander uh, with the tinny laughter, and he said, okay, we'll let a Jew. They found one Ramden Jew who still, uh, he died only a few years ago, but in his heart, he says, you're released, you're out of here. Why? Some priest is taking your place. Kolbu was the first. It was his getting beatified and then turned into a saint was a piece of cake. This guy was genuinely something like, but thousands of priests died. Many of the priests who died were Jews who had converted when they were young. Hitler didn't care. The Nazis didn't care. If you were a Jew, you were a Jew. If you were a priest, it didn't make any difference. You were going to go anyway. Here, German priests give the Nazi salute. German Protestants as well. Here are priests uh, giving the Protestants the, uh, the Nazi salute. You got other Protestants did it too. They simply folded in under, except the ones who said, I won't do this. Take me, let me die, and thousands of them did. Protestant ministers, Catholic priests, they died in Auschwitz and in concentration camps with everybody else. It looked like the end of the world. Warsaw was in ruins. London was bombed into rubble. Uh, finally, we stayed out of it because the American policy was, it's Europe's war, we're not getting in. We stayed out. So the day, but per, the Japanese couldn't wait. They bombed Pearl Harbor. FDR gets the Congress on December 8th and declares war on whom? A little, a little interesting footnote. Who did FDR declare war on? I, I asked the Congress to declare a state of war exists between the United States and the empire of Japan. We only declared war on Japan. Two days later, Hitler declares war on us. We never would have declared war on the Germans. They declared war on us. Uh, yeah, it's just interesting how all this diplomacy works. Anyway, FDR, we will triumph, so help us God. God is with uns. The Germans say God is with us. We knew God was with us. So God is on our side. You know, the most popular song of World War II is praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. 
If you're over the age of 60, you may remember that song. Berlin was in ruins, finally, American arm. We bombed the year Germans into rubble, and it, it really, but now, 45, if this didn't look like the apocalypse, nothing did. The dropping of the atom, this is Berlin, uh, Tokyo burning just with incendiary bombs. But then comes the real apocalypse, the atomic age, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, 1945, the day after the first atomic bomb, People are ready. This is it. When will Christ return? There's a young Baptist minister in the United States who by 1950 is already filling up football stadiums. He's still alive today. But already in America, there were 20, then 30, then 40, then 50 million evangelicals who said Christ is on his way because who said so? This young Baptist evangelical name who could preach your socks off, Billy Graham. Billy Graham. You go Google Billy Graham if you'd ever heard of him, and he is the he was the consummate Baptist preacher who could. I mean, he came just at the right time. What new technology gave Billy Graham his great moment? Television. They were televangelists. Just the capacity to reach millions and millions, and they're still all over the country now. Tremendous capacity to reach people. Now, what, what was this thing called World War II? We, there were thousands of mass graves like this all over Europe. I mean, people, we don't know who's even in here. Uh, 50 million were dead. Was this an angry God's wrath? Is God ready to destroy the world again and rebuild it? You know, what's going on? So the, those who are sure that Christ is, that somebody's going to, that Messiah, Moshiach, the hidden Iman, something's got to happen. And then comes this. May 14th, 1948, the United Nations acknowledges the existence of a Jewish state in the Middle East, in the Holy Land. And is this the sign? For Christian evangelicals, for those, I mean, of the... The Jews had already been decimated. If I mean, six million out of 14 million are dead, you got seven, eight million. Of the seven, eight million that are alive, how many of them are? How many of them are observant? How many of them are Zionist? Well, the Zionist movement in the United States in 46, 7, and 8 was not enormous. The Jews in this country had been there now second generation, third generation, their old folks had died or were 80 or 70 and they're in a nursing home. This is a generation coming back from World War II, having fought, and what do they want? What do they want? The overwhelming number of American Jews. They may be interested in the Jewish homeland, but what are they? What do they want? They want a car. They want a split-level home in suburbia. They want the real estate agents to get the hell out of their way. They want the American dream. The Amer and how do you get the American dream? You assimilate and you put yourself in a pot with an Italian, with an Irishman, with a Pole, with everything. And what do you do with the pot? A little water, a carrot, a celery. And what do you do? You cook it up and what do you make? A soup that is made up of a melting pot. You melt it all together, and you can't, when you take out a ladleful, what do you got? You no longer have a Jew, an Italian, an Irishman, or a Czech, or a Pole. What do you got? You got an American who is assimilated, who then, then can get into the suburb, maybe in Long Island or uh, in, uh, in West Roxbury. So the state of Israel comes along, but for Jewish, for Christian Zionists, this is the biggest thing in the world. Okay, so just a few thoughts to think about for you for the next hundred years of your lives. Um, is war in the name of God inevitable? I don't have the answer to any of these. All I got is questions. Does it, does it have to be constantly war in the name of God? Is war without God inevitable? I mean, you had uh, Hitler and Stalin were atheists. They didn't care. They killed more people than anybody else. I mean, 50 million, Hitler is responsible for all the people who died. So in Stalin, God knows how many people he wound up killing. What changes? Well, technology and the capacity for mass death, either in an age of faith or no faith, it doesn't seem to make any difference, whether it's people of faith or no faith. Are we God's creation or just a naked ape? 
That question I asked you the first day when I said, you know, I'm not going to cross a line. I don't have the answer to any of these, but those are the two big issues. Did God create us in his image, or we, as uh, uh, Darwin said, and then uh, Edward Wilson, the great Harvard ethnobiologist, says, you know, our time on Earth, Wilson says our time on Earth is maybe another thousand years. And then, who takes over? Not the cockroaches, he had a, a little higher than that. Who takes over, Edmund Wilson says? The wasps, the bees, the most cooperative are the ants and the termites, who are huge in number. They outweigh us already three or four to one. I mean, if you ever weighed all the termites in the world, they weigh more than all the people in the world. So which are we? Well, we got to figure that out. And then have a nice day. That's the end of our conversation about that aspect of it. Now, now we got to get back to our literature, because it's, this affects, this affects our writers, our, our writers, and affects the people that we're going to read about in the last three weeks of the course. Meanwhile, back in Woodenton, Long Island, for those of you who started uh, Eli the Fanatic, Eli the Fanatic, it takes place in a, in a nice little village in Waspy, Long Island, called Woodenton, Long Island. It's May 1948. What is never mentioned in that story, this is the month, in fact, one of the dates on the letters, I think I just sent you an email just before I came here. It said, look at the dates on the letters. What's out there? What's happening? May 1948. The creation of a Jewish state. So the, the, it's happened in the Middle East already, but not in Woodenton. Eli Peck, who is the central character for us in the story, wakes up and faces another day. The American dream, the melting pot, memory and trying to forget. That's what this story is all about, trying to forget, trying to finally break the chain, break the rope, break the invisible string, break it and say, it's over. Whatever happened in my past is my past, and I acknowledge it not at all. I am now a homogenized American. I paint my rocks pink, and I put plastic flamingos on my lawn. That is Woodenton, Long Island. What price to pay in order to belong? How much are you willing to give up? How much of your past are you willing to give up? And that is the real theme. There's a line in it that's an iconic line when this exchange goes on in the story, which you have now on your email, because I sent you the plot about uh, 10 minutes before class. No news reached Woodenton? Some, a refugee rabbi left, who survived the destruction of European Jews asks somebody in the town, no news reached Woodenton? What do you think it means? You'll find out when you read the story. But what do you think it means? You didn't hear? And many Americans, I mean, that, that was very significant because many Americans, Jews, non-Jews and all, the word about Hitler didn't get out. And when they did get out, they didn't believe it, or they didn't care. Europe was Europe, we're going to win this war, and that's it. But what was going on in the death camps, and right after the war ended, what started? Right after the war ended in 45, what started in 46? What started in 46? Another war. The Cold War. The Cold War started. Germany had been divided, we grabbed have any of you seen Monuments Men? Any of you seen Monuments Men, the movie? The Russians came in. The Russians grabbed East Germany. We grabbed West Germany. And each side then begins to demonize it. As far as we're concerned, where were all the Nazis? In the other side. For the Russians, where are all the Nazis? In our side. So the, the need to demonize, we needed West Germany. And we were not that interested in making every German believe that he or she was responsible for the 50 million dead. So psychology was already at work here. No news reached Woodenton. You didn't hear. You didn't know what was going on. It becomes a very important line. OK, what is bothering Philip Roth? Now, he sets the story in 1948, but he writes the story in 1959. So by 1959, he published it in 1960, 
Roth is bothered by something. We, we, you know, we have a general idea of what was bothering Sholem Aleichem, he, but what was bothering him was these people better know they got to get out of this country. It's not going to work, and there are too many old Jews who don't get it. Poor Tavia and Gold, they don't understand. Their kids understand, and the old ways are going to go. That was basically, but Sholem Aleichem stayed out of it as much as he could. Roth has got an ax to grind, and he grinds that ax for you to read and understand. If you were reading this story in 1960, what's the most important thing? He's not writing it in Yiddish. Which means what? He's writing it, yeah, but who can read this stuff? Everybody. So when he writes something nasty about a Jew, about Menachem Mendel or Padatzor, who you know most of, the Jews in kaftans running around hiding uh, in the Shalomash stories. Uh, when he writes something, it's not just for the Jews to read, it's for everything to read. Mario Puzzo, the author of the novel The Godfather, was called by many Italians who resented this image of the Italian being only associated with crime and the underworld. So he was called a self-hating Italian. Roth was called by many Jews a self-hating Italian. Jew. They use this story and the next one that you're going to read, Goodbye Columbus, as an example of it. Yeah, you deserve 10 minutes. Okay, go ahead. We'll, we'll, so weekend, Tuesday, Eli the Fanatic. Thursday, Goodbye Columbus. Goodbye Columbus is 130 pages long. 130 pages. Read. You've got to start reading right away. Get the characters' names down. Try to get it all written down.